How's it going? Hello. So I just wanted to say one thing. Are you, are you a Muslim? Yes, I'm Muslim. Welcome to the panel. So I see your life sometimes. You talk about Muhammad did this, you bring up the hadiths. But the problem here is that you're basing everything on Western ideologies. Okay. You know, you're saying this Muhammad, he, he did this to so his wife, he struck his wife, he did this. But this, they are the ideologies from the Kufar, you know? Hmm. Do you think, do you think that these Western ideologies that I'm using are good ideologies? Like, do you think it's good to not hit your wife for a man not to hit his wife? You think that's a good virtue? So I believe what is good is decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not decided by, especially not the kufar. They do not decide what is good and what is bad. What is, what is so kufar? What is Prophet the... Muhammad, if our Prophet does something, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he does it, uh -huh. and there's tafsirs on it, scholars agree on it, mm -hmm. then we as Muslims, we have nothing to say. They will have nothing to say. Okay. That, okay, I guess that answers the question. So basically, um, this Western ideology that I have that a man should never hit his wife because she is a weaker vessel, she's he's stronger physically, and he's meant to protect her and provide for her and love her like he loves his own self. You're saying that that is a, a ideology of a disbeliever and it's not a good ideology, just to be clear. No, what I'm saying is that it's not like the Quran is not saying, you know, the husband can just hit his wife. There are rules. You have to follow. Um, there are steps. You know. You know. It's saying that if, in case of you know disobedience or something like that, if you fear, you know? if you fear disobedience, yes, yes, yes. So this, she doesn't even have to commit an act of disobedience. It's if you fear it, he, he's able to do what he. And another wants. another problem is that you know when you ask too much questions, you know why is Allah doing this? Why is it like this? You know, as a Muslim, you can fall into you know, doubts and Good. you can start to question why Allah is doing something. Good. And, you know, Allah knows better than we do. He created us. So... I don't think so. I think... Muslims, you don't, you don't question what Allah does. That's so, just simple. Well, that's... In, simple. It's, what you just said is important. What you just said is very, very important. The second that you begin to question these commands or permissibilities and actions of Allah, then that gives room for you to now doubt Allah and Islam. And you shouldn't be doing that, is what you're saying. What you said is extremely important, which is why I say that this is, that's cult mentality, for you to not question Allah and these commands and these verses and hadith and the actions of Muhammad, because it'll cause you to start doubting. Here's my thing. I think that even you as a Muslim, that you are better than Muhammad and Allah, that you have better values. I can, I think I can prove that to you. Okay, so I, I will say that is incorrect because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the best man to walk on the earth. He is the best example we follow. So me as a Muslim, um, I commit many sins. You know, he is the best to have walk, walk this earth. So Muhammad committed, no Muhammad committed many sins too. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad committed many sins too. Did you know that? But at the end of the day, he is the best example, the best man to walk the earth. So I cannot, as for him, as a messenger of Allah, mm -hmm. Allah has chosen him. I cannot compare myself to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That, that's just... Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Final. Let me ask you this. Is a um, <clears throat> is a person who sins, is a person who is sin who sins a better example than one who does not sin? So this is this is exactly what my point was earlier. The point was now you're asking many questions, and the problem is that we stray further from Allah and what He has decided. We start to question what Allah is um, is. Um, his decisions. Why? So why would Allah choose 
the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, if he wasn't uh, going to be a good example, you know. So in if we we can see this as Prophet and uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala, he already knows what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do. He would do. He already knows it, you know. So. You know, we as Muslims, obviously, we believe that uh, Allah, He knows everything. He's the one who created us, you know? Yeah, but I didn't ask that. So it's it's okay to ask questions, sister. It's okay to ask no, no. critical it's thinking questions. Okay. If you are going to question Allah's decisions, then it's, you are on, on dangerous well, grounds. Well, see, this, man, this is, this is you, man, I, I am glad that you came up because this is bringing a, this is giving good light on, Muslim, you know, ideology, you know, unreal Muslim ideology. You're not supposed to critically think. You're not supposed to um, ask critical questions or, and, and deduce things and things that's in Islam. You're, you're not supposed to do that. When I asked you this basic question, you're right, of who do you think is a better example, one who sins or one who does not sin? You're even saying that that's a dangerous question because it can lead you to doubting Allah. That's deep. Yes, yeah, that's true. That's let me true. let me let me share with you something. With the the so I, I know you may not believe because you know you're Muslim. You may not believe in the previous scriptures, um, but in in the previous scriptures, the prophet Isaiah, God reasoning with Israel, he tells Israel to come. He says, let us reason together. This is God talking, saying, come, let us reason together. He invites the people of Israel to reason with him, you know, to critically think with him because God is confident enough to reason with his people to know that the conclusion is that he is the best option and that he knows what's best for them. And he can reason with them to come to that conclusion too. But in Islam, it's the opposite. You're not supposed to reason with Allah. You can't because then you start doubting. But here, here, I'm thinking, how can you reason with the one who created you? The one who already knows everything. Everything. He knows everything. He knows more than what you do. And he's mo he knows more than what your brain is capable of knowing. You know, just answer that. How is it possible? How can you question decisions that God's make he knows everything everything that you don't know more than you know well well it's 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 like this because God gave us a a mind for a reason and our mind reflects him this this uh this 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 uh aspect of reason that we have and questioning you know it, it it's reflective of God he has given us this mind to inquire to be creative to deduce and think, you know what I'm saying? It's a reflection of him. So that's why we're able, he allows us to think when it comes to him and, you know, question in sincerity, not question as in we're putting God on, you know, on the hot seat and we're the judges, not in that way. You know, we don't, we don't question God in that way, but it's just far as, you know, just questioning or having questions about his commands or what, what he wants from us and his desires and his purpose. And these are this, that's okay. He, he invite the true God invites that only a false God would not want you to question or reason with him. Only a false God who's afraid of you doubting and using your brain to where you're now coming outside of the darkness and coming outside of that box. Only a false God, a false God, will give this ideology that you're not supposed to think or question in that way. But that that is what faith is. Faith is believing something that is, there's no, you know, there's no evidence, you know, from the Kufaris, there's no evidence in that way, but we have faith, we believe. Even though we haven't seen it with our own eyes, we we know that there's been a prophet, that, he has he has delivered his message and we, we believe in that message. This is something, this is faith. You well, know? well, that's we have we have two different definitions of what faith is. What you just described is blind faith. The Bible actually says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the book of Hebrews. 
So how the Bible defines faith is that faith has substance to it. Faith has evidence to it, even though you haven't seen the particular thing yet, but there's evidence, right? And, and substance to why you should trust. So faith is trusting in the evidence that you have in the result that you haven't seen yet. That's what faith is. Blind faith is just believing blindly, you know, with no evidence, no substance. That's what you described as blind faith. The Bible doesn't say that's what faith is. The Bible says faith is based on evidence. But the thing is, there's there's many things, you know, in even in Islam that we don't know. We say Allah A'lam, God knows best. Mm -hmm. The things we that, that are not answered. Yeah. So we don't know if it's true or, or we don't know, you know, the why it is, you know. So we trust Allah, we say God knows best and we don't dive deeper, we don't start questioning that. So we we, we base everything on um, tafsir, what the scholars have provided for us. Um, and faith. Yeah, so, basically. yeah, but there's there's an issue here. Yes, there are instances, right, where God knows best. There's instances where we we can't lean on our own understanding, like we're limited. So we got to just give it up to God. God knows he, his ways are not like ours and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't eliminate the ability to question things at all. You have to be able to reason with your faith. You have to be able to reason with your worldview. You as a Muslim, you have to have a reason why you're, you're saying the, the Quran is true, why Islam is true. You can't just say, Allahu Alam, I just accept Islam, that's it. I believe it's from God, boom, 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 that's it. You have to have a reason for your faith. Even, even the Bible says this too. Notice how what what you're saying and like that's in islam in christianity it's completely different in christianity it says to be able to give a reason for your faith when asked give a reason be able to defend your faith right you're supposed to be able to do that in the truth only in a lie would it not want you to critically think to give an answer to reason only in a cult, in a lie, does it profess such ideologies. If you can't simply reason with me, you know, as just us human beings, on who, what is a better example to follow, a sinner or a non-sinner? If you can't reason with me on something as basic and simple as that, that's a problem. The thing is that at the end of the day, we Muslims, we believe what has been presented, you know, to us, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his message in the Quran, the Holy Quran, that he, the revelation he got, that is what we believe. And the Quran is indestructible. The Quran, there's nothing that can be, no, no human can produce anything like the Quran, not even one single verse. That is what is in the in that what the Quran says. No I, human can, right. can do can do what the Quran did. I like it's that. It's a unique book. It's uh, a unique book. Now, now do you see what you're doing? Now what you're doing is now you're giving me arguments for Islam. So this is what I would ask you, sister. If then you were to find out that someone was able to make a verse like it, even a single verse, that would then prove the Quran false, right? Because the Quran says that's impossible. So if someone was able to do that, then that would prove the Quran false, right? Yes, if you're using that logic, yes, it would be would true. Beautiful. But no one can't. So that's the other argument. No okay, one can't. So exactly. Impossible. I got you. So this is what I want to show you, sis. I want to show you that this actually happened. And I want you to show you that this happened within Islam. Umar, are you familiar with Umar? Yes, so you're talking to Umar ibn Khattab. That's yes. right, Umar ibn Khattab. He actually came up with three verses that were like the Quran. In fact, they were so much like the Quran that they actually became verses of the Quran. Let me show you this. Sahih al-Bukhari, 4483. It says, Umar said, I agreed with Allah in three things. Or said, my Lord agreed with me in three things. I said, O oh, Allah's messenger, would that you took the station 
mention of Abraham as a place of prayer. All right? And then that verse was revealed. I also said, O oh, Allah's messenger, good and bad persons visit you. Would that you ordered the mothers of the believers to cover themselves with veils. So the divine verses of Al-Hijab were revealed. I came to know that the prophet had blamed some of the, his wives. So I entered upon them and said, you should either stop troubling the prophet or else Allah will give his apostle better wives than you. When I came to one of his, one of his wives, she said to Umar, oh, Umar, does Allah's messenger have what he could advise his wives with that you try to advise them? Thereupon, Allah revealed, it may be if he divorced you, his Lord will give him instead of you wives better than you Muslims. Chapter 66, verse 5. That's literally what Umar said. So Umar was able to come up, was able to say three things that were so good that they even became Quran verses. So that means that the, the challenge has been met. Oops. And the Quran is false. Yeah, I don't have an answer to this. I don't know. Um, that's fair enough. Maybe that the seer, the, the seer explains or something. You know, I'll just, I'm just saying this, sister, and you don't have to give an answer like right now or anything like that. I'm just saying that um, when we begin to critically think about the challenges that the Quran sets up for us, right? And we see and we go into this and dive into it. You were right. That when we begin to challenge the Quran or think critically, we're gonna you're going to see that it's not it's it's not true, it's false. By even by the Quran's own standards. I mean, I, I see your I see your logic, you mm -hmm. know. Thank um, you. but I don't know. Yeah, but the thing is sometimes I see, you know, a lot of lives like this and they pull up hadiths and the hadiths, you know. From the outside, you know, looking in, they might look very, like, uh, ridiculous. Um, but, you know, as Muslims, it's like we cannot be like, oh, this is this is false. This is ridiculous. You Even if you think that, you can't, you can't say that, you know? Hmm. So there was, there was an example um, of the hadith, in one hadith where the, um, there was, I think it was a hadith about Moses. It was a stone, something, uh, it was a stone who, who stole his clothes or something. Yeah. And, you know, at first uh, thought that is very, like, ridiculous. Like, why are you beating up a stone? You know, so, yeah. but it's like, as Muslims, you gotta, like, supp suppress those thoughts. It's like, you can't think. No, no, no. As a Muslim, you do not, oh, did you guys hear what she just said? She said, as a Muslim, you got to suppress those thoughts. No, you let those thoughts rise. You think, you know, it's ridiculous. So don't, don't suppress it. Challenge it. Let it, if, if Allah is true and Islam is true, then it should be able to withstand the scrutiny of your doubts. If Islam is true, it should be able to withstand your critical thinking and reasoning skills. But it can't. What you have to do is suppress your thoughts, suppress your reasoning, suppress your critical thinking so that you can stay a Muslim. I say, God forbid, and I invite you to a better way. Within Christ, you do not have to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You don't have to suppress it. Within Christ, you can ask these questions. You can bring your reasoning to Christ. Lay it before him, and he answers you. How do you know that you, you know, that you are invited to question and uh, challenge in the, in Christianity? How do you know that? That's literally the commandment, greatest commandment: love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So he invites us to be emotionally connect, connected with him. Heart, have our heart, love him with all our heart to be 
spiritually connected with him, love him with all our soul, and to intellectually be in love with him, love him with all our mind. That's what our God invites us to. Okay, so then my question would be, why is, you know, why is Christ the truth? <laughs> Very good question. Why is Christ the truth? This is what Jesus says in John chapter 14. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me, let me show you what convinced me. I'm going to read you something. And you tell me who this is about, okay? I promise you, you're going to get it. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the sins of us all. Sister N, who does that sound like to you? Jesus. I think Jesus, yes. Yep. Sounds exactly like Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting about this. I'm not reading the gospel. I'm not reading anything in the New Testament. I'm reading the book of Isaiah. This is the book Isaiah, book of Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. And in chapter 53 of Isaiah, this is 700 years before Jesus is born. But in, you know, Islam, they, we, we think that um, that was not Jesus. God already they took him up to the, you know, he already, it was someone else that died hey. on, the, on the cross. Uh -huh. It was not Jesus. I'm going to read you another passage. You tell me what it sounds like. This is Psalm 22, sister. It says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a post herd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me they have pierced my hands and my feet. Who does that sound like, sister? Jesus. Yep. So we have Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, speaking of Jesus, talking about him being pierced, him dying for our sins and things of this nature. And you also have prophet David, Dawood, in the Zabur, in the Psalms, prophesying about the Messiah, saying that he will be pierced, having his hands and his feet Pierce being surrounded by his enemies, mocked and ridiculed. That's two. Let me show you another one. Let's go to the Torah, Moses. To the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Then God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head while you shall bruise his heel. Let me ask you, who is the offspring of the woman? Jesus. Exactly. Let me show you one more. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. So this is God speaking. He says this. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, we've been seeing a theme here. Who, according to all the scriptures that we've been seeing, is the one that's pierced? Sister, who is that? Yes, it sounds like it sounds like Jesus. It's Jesus. Now let me ask you this. When you have all of the scriptures, all of the scriptures, all agreeing with the same thing. Hold on, let me get you Jesus now. Let me just finish it off with Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 46, this is what he says here. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you 
while I was still with you, that everything written about me, this is what Jesus is saying, everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So who should I take? If I'm being critically, if I'm thinking critically and being honest, who should I take, Sister Ann? Should I line up with, or go with all the prophets who over generations and generations apart from each other, some 700 years, some 1,000, some 500, some 300 years apart, all for some reason have the same revelation about the Messiah. And then we finally get to Jesus who says, yes, this is about me. I have fulfilled this that the Messiah should suffer? Should I go with them who all agree and have the same revelation, the same thread? Or should I go with the Quran that comes 600 years after Jesus and then contradicts what we just read, what all the prophets of the past said over and over and over again? Who should I go with? I would say you should go with uh, whatever everyone else said, the prophet said, and stuff like that. Boom. And that is why, sister, you should leave Islam today and come to the truth of the Messiah. So the problem here is that um, that the, the previous the scriptures, even though, like as you showed with the, with the Quran, like it seems like it's true. So... The relationship between those scriptures um, is kind of, it's not really, one is saying something and the other one is saying something else. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like you can't really know what's true. You can though. Remember I told you, we we know what's true. Remember what we, we said it together. We know what's true when there is consistency, right? When you have... All the way from the beginning in Genesis, Moses in the Torah, agreeing with David in the Psalms, agreeing with prophet Isaiah, agreeing with prophet Daniel, agreeing with prophet Zechariah, and agreeing finally with Jesus, the gospel, we see that there's a common thread, a consistency. And the only odd man out is the Quran that disagrees with them all. While yes, at the that same, is true. Hmm? that is true. Right. So for me, what I'm thinking is, um, obviously, I do believe in the scriptures, the the previous scriptures. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, as you said, there's a there's a Quran who says something else. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to piece together is, you know, what happened, um, what happened in the way, you know, like from when Muhammad received his um, his revelation. I'll tell you what happened. From the angel Gabriel. Oh, I'll tell you what happened, sister. You are asking such. <laughs> you see what happens when you think and you allow yourself to think and these conclusions are coming? Oh my gosh. Chapter one, verse six of Galatians. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, verse eight, watch this. But even if we, this is an apostle speaking, it says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we, we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary than the one you received, 
let him be accursed. So you see here, the Bible has already warned us that there's people and there will be people in the future. Muhammad's not the only one. There's a guy named Joseph Smith. There's Ellen G. White. And there's a bunch of false prophets out there. There's people that are coming with a different message that is inconsistent with the one that we have already received from the prophets. Yeah, so, yeah, I see how it's a, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I have been thinking about, um, one question, I even brought this to um, a sheikh. I asked this, but the, the answer wasn't really... It wasn't really answered. Mm. So I, I was wondering if uh, anyone saw, you know, the prophet receive the revelation mm. because he was in a cave. Yeah. Um, alone. It was a, you know, a private uh, mm -hmm. interaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but, you know, afterwards he came to uh, his uh, wife and he, he told her about the revelation, but no one, you know, saw the actual interaction. Exactly. No one. So that's something. Yeah, there's there's no witnesses to uh, Muhammad's interaction in the cave. There's no witnesses. As a matter of fact, here's what's interesting. Uh, you know how supposedly it's supposed to be the angel Gabriel. Well, that spirit or whatever that entity was that came to Muhammad in the cave never never made himself known as Gabriel. Never. Never ever. But here's what's interesting. Again, on top of that, whenever we look at, so it was Warica that had to tell Muhammad, it was Warica that told Muhammad, oh, don't worry, that's that's the angel Gabriel who, who appeared to the prophets. Now remember, our common thing, how do we know something is true? With consistency, if it's consistent with the prophets. Whenever we look at, whenever Gabriel appears in the previous scriptures, he always makes himself known. He says, be not afraid. I'm Gabriel. Here, you have this spirit, this entity, who Warica says is Gabriel, doesn't make himself known to Muhammad, doesn't say, I'm Gabriel, and doesn't calm Muhammad down, doesn't say, fear not. Don't worry. Be not afraid. He actually incites Muhammad's fear. It's so bad that Muhammad comes out of the cave it says that his like his veins are popping. You can see his veins is beating. Like you know when you're you're afraid and your heart is beating really fast, you can even see like your pulse beating, vein pulsing. And it says that he went and I'm reading it right here. It's Sahih Al Bukhari number three. He went to Khadija and said, "Cover me, cover me." He was seeking refuge with Khadija. And it says they covered him till until his fear was over. And after that, he told her everything that had happened and said, I fear that something may happen to me. This is not biblical. You never see this with, with the prophets and, and with the experiences with Gabriel and the angels of God. Never. Yeah, yeah it is uh, definitely a problem. Yeah. I think um, <clears throat> a lot of like uh, inconsistencies as well, yeah. um, everything that uh, you pre presented. But to me, the biggest thing is, you know, this question that I was just thinking about because because it was a private, we, we don't, because they, they say sometimes that Muhammad uh, did perform miracles. <laughs> um, not so, but the biggest is the revelation of the Quran. That's the biggest miracle. Yeah. But, um, yeah, says, I, don't, I don't know. Remember, when we first started, it's amazing. When we first started, you had the mindset of where you you was not questioning. You you were not going to allow yourself to to go into these thoughts and to go deeper into this stuff. And but you have now allowed yourself to do so, and you see this stuff. The, the, yeah, that's the, the only the problem I have here is you know, like like you said the. You know what's in between the with the gospel and the Quran, like you know what happened on the way, and you know the, the, just the fact that you know that the Prophet Muhammad um, would have been like deceived. I don't know something like that. 
because the because of that for the fact that the Quran is is contradicting itself sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that logic, does that mean the gospel is the is the true truth? Yes, ma'am. That means that the gospel is the truth, and it's not because the Quran is false. That's not that's not why the gospel is true. The gospel is true because it is consistent and in line with what God has already revealed in the past before the gospel came into fruition, right? We saw in the Torah, we saw in Isaiah, we saw in the Psalms, we saw in Zechariah, we saw in Daniel, the gospel already being foretold before we even get the gospel, right? So the gospel is consistent. It's a fulfillment of what the prophets had already revealed through the revelation of God. That's how we know the gospel is true. So. Yeah, I think uh, most most Muslims, you know, they, you know, they see it, but maybe they are, you know, they're suppressing it because because of um, they're saying that they have to have faith in Allah that this is this is the truth, mm-hmm. and I think that is the problem because. You know, I think every person, every person thinks that some of the things that the prophet did was not uh, good, mm-hmm. of course. So, you know, and then to hold him to, you know, a standard to say he's the most perfect human that uh, will, there's there's like an inner conflict with, within yourself that you still have to like suppress. In this live, that was you, <laughs> right? In this live, yeah. that was yeah, that's, you. That's true. And it's not you anymore. For me, you know, when you, I've never seen the, these uh, these verses or these um, these hadiths before, mm. so for me, you know, I've always heard, you know, the 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 Bible is corrupted, the scriptures are corrupted, mm-hmm. it can't be trusted. Yep. But I, I don't know where where it came from. Yeah. That uh, I don't know where that came from. I haven't seen the verses in the in the Quran, so yeah. it's, it's it's kind of like you're in like a state of shock, you know. Yeah, of course, of course. You know, when when you're on the from the outside looking in, you're looking at the, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, or if you're looking at the, you know, Jesus. You know, the, I think there's there's definitely a difference. Like when you think about the mm-hmm. characters, like Jesus never married, to, you know, like a nine year old. So yep. there's definitely a differences. So you know? I, you know, what I think, I think that now we're at a part where I can, I can re-ask you this question. And I think that you're now at a, at a place where you can answer it now. What do you think is the better example? Following someone who was sinful or following someone who never sinned? Which one is the better example? Yeah, following someone who's not a sin, who hasn't committed sin. Exactly. The law of God, when it comes down to sin, has a price. And the price of it is death. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the price of sin is death. So why is death necessary? Because death is the price by which we had to pay. We were going to have to die. And it's not just like our physical death because we still die physically, right? But it's an eternal death because we sin against God. The punishment is eternal. It's everlasting. And so we needed an everlasting payment for that to overcome the debt that we owe. Now in Leviticus, it says this, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The Messiah would be the ultimate sacrifice. That his sacrifice will be the everlasting sacrifice that finalizes it all. That's why Jesus said on the cross, he said, it is finished. Yeah, I I, I can't honestly deny that that is, you know, honorable and that is like a sign of love. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like if if a mother, she would be willing to die for her child. Exactly. You know, and it's, it's driven by... You know, it's an act of love, basically. Yeah, so absolutely. 
Yeah, I was thinking, you know, how can how can this be be real? Because how can God do that? Yeah. But then, but then it's like it has a problem with, you know, in the Quran, you know, where God is, you know, he he's all powerful. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why couldn't he do that? Yeah, it's kind of like exactly for <laughs> we to decide. The thing is, um, the thing is, you know, doubts they are they are there. They are obviously there. But the thing that was suppressed thing you know you know everything is questioning is you know this this faith or this blind faith that you said that is the that, that is the, basically the obstacle so when that is you know out of the way mm -hmm. everything is just comes you know like everything it's like a flood you know yes there's so many things like yes there's no yes yeah amen Okay, so like, how would one go about if they would want to like get you know connect with with God? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's really simple, sister. Um, I can give you a model, but this is I'll I'll give you what to do. Um, all you have to do is you get alone by yourself, or you can do it here, no matter where you are, and you come to God honestly. You come to God honestly, you come to him boldly, and you say, God, in your words, it has to be from your, it has to be your own words in your own heart. God, please forgive me of my sins. I believe in you as your Lord, as the Lord. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who died for my sins. I believe you rose him again for the third day. You confess that he died and he rose again, All right? And you say that you confess this with your mouth. You believe this in your heart and you confess this out loud and say, <clears throat> I am yours. Tell him that you're, that you belong to him and tell him that you are inviting him into your life. You do that. You make that confession with your heart. It's true and genuine, with your own words. Instantly you are connected with God and the Bible says you're saved. And then after that, you then begin your walk in Christ. You get a Bible. You begin to read the gospel, read about Jesus and his teachings, read about the prophets, um, and also find a church, get connected with a church, a good Bible-believing church that's teaching good doctrine, right? Um, get a community and get connected with your church. And... Um, and God will lead you from there. Okay. So first thing, it's an outward confession. This is what the Bible says here. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved for with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved okay for the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame okay so it's an honest heartfelt confession from yourself from your own spirit from your own heart and you give this outward confession from the heart that you believe in God, that you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he ruled. God raised him from the dead and you are now adopted into the family of God. You're now a sister in the faith. Do you believe him sister? That's what I ask you. Do you believe him? believe what do you mean do you believe do you believe that jesus is lord yeah i have to say considering everything um and the evidence and because i believe in the in the in the scriptures that the previous ones then i have to I have to say yes yes and do you believe that God raised him from the dead for our sins, as the scriptures have said? Yeah, yes, I do. Then you're saved, sister. Welcome to the family of Christ. 
Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Logic. Thank you.